some organic molecules are what we call chiral. This means they are handed like a left hand or a right hand. And the two molecules, either the left-handed one or the right-handed one, are called stereoisomers. We're going to go into something called stereochemistry, which is a three-dimensional structure and how molecules differ from each other in the three-dimensional space. Stereoisomers are compounds that have the same connectivity, meaning they have the same carbons attached to each other and the same bonds and things like that, but they're arranged differently in space so they don't fit into each other's space. We've already seen an example of stereoisomers, and that is the cis-trans isomers. And if we look down here at the bottom of the screen, you can see we have cis-2-butene and trans-butene. They have the same connectivity, a methyl attached to a carbon, which is in a double bond, which is attached to another carbon in that double bond, which is then attached to a methyl group. But you can see their arrangement in space is different. Because the double bond can't flip, you can't twist it, these two molecules do not fit in each other's space, and so they are stereoisomers. We're going to look at another type of stereoisomer now. And uh, this stereo, uh, th this type of stereoisomer is so something called, based on something called chirality. Okay, in this stereochemistry, we're going to look at chiral carbons. Chiral means handed, just as in you have a right hand or a left hand, and your right hand is different from your left hand. If you were to cut off your right hand and put it on in place of your left hand, you would look at it and say, that's not right. And you know that you can take a right-handed glove and put it on your left hand, but it's not right. It doesn't fit. If you hold your two hands in front of yourself and you look at your two hands, do this right now, you can see that your right hand is a mirror image of the left hand and vice versa. Meaning that if you were to put a mirror up opposite your right hand and you looked in the mirror, it would look like how your left hand looks. And if you want to, just go find a mirror and do this so you can see what we're talking about in this handedness. Um, now, why is this important to chemistry? Two things that are mirror images of each other and they don't fit in each other's space, th meaning they're non-superimposable, are called chiral. And we have this anytime you have a carbon it's, that is tetrahedral and it has four different groups on it. Here is a carbon that has four different groups on it. They're called all different colors to make them different. If I go and I make the mirror image of it on the other side, you can see they look very similar, but when I go and I try to move them so that they are in each other's space, so that I took them and separated them, and now I'm going to turn them around. So I'm turning the molecule around so that I can go and try and fit one molecule in the other molecule's space. You can see the blue and the blue line up and the yellow and the yellow line up, but the red and green are switched. You can't put them in the same space. So the carbons here are chiral and the two different molecules are called enantiomers. Enantiomers are non-superimposable mirror images, and any time you have a chiral carbon, you will get enantiomers, two possibilities. So how do you recognize a chiral atom? What you do is you look to see, is it tetrahedral? And you have to have four single bonds for it to be tetrahedral. And on each of those single bonds, you have to have four different groups. And when we look at the group, we look at everything attached. Not just that it's a carbon, but also what's attached to the carbons also. And we'll see in, in uh, some example slides. Uh, two non-superimposable carbons that have four different groups 
are chiral. They are mirror images of each other. So what you do is you look at each group that at is attached and see if it is four different groups. If it's so, then you can find, then you can state that that atom is chiral. The whole reason that chirality occurs is because you have a lack of symmetry. It is symmetry that allows things to be superimposable, and it is a lack of symmetry that prevents uh, the superimposability. So it really is when you have a plane of reflection that one side of the molecule is the same as the other, then you have an achiral molecule or an achiral carbon. So that's what this results from. How do you find a chiral carbon though? Let's look at how you go through the process. What you do is you look at a carbon and you look to see what groups, not atoms, but groups are attached. Here we're just looking at atoms and you can see there are four different atoms. But realize when we look at bigger molecules, you look, have to look at everything that's attached not just the first atom. If any two groups are the same, the atom is achiral. If all four groups are different, then the atom is chiral. So I can look at this molecule and see there are four different groups, so the atom is chiral. If I look at these two compounds, let's look at the first carbon in red. If I look at that carbon, I can see attached to it is a hydrogen. Look all the way over on the left. Attached to that carbon that's in red, there's a hydrogen. And then there's a two carbon group that has uh, carboxylic acid and an alcohol on it on the, the right of that red carbon. Then there's an alcohol group attached. And then there's a COOH attached. That is four different groups, and so that car carbon is chiral. If I look at the next carbon, you can see it also has four different groups, a hydrogen, a COOH, an OH, and then two carbons with three hydrogens and three oxygens. So two carbons are chiral there. If I look at the next compound over, you can see the in epinephrine, excuse me, ephedrine, then you can see the carbon on the, um, the left is, has a hydrogen and a carbon with a nitrogen on it and an OH and then a benzene ring. The other carbon that's on the right, the one in red, has an amine on it, it has a methyl group on it, it has a carbon that has a benzene group attached to it, and it has a hydrogen, so four different groups. So we can just identify chiral carbons by looking for four different groups. So if I look at this, go ahead and try to look and see if you can find any carbons that are chiral here. And we'll go through this after you try it on your own. We'll go through and look at this. So pause, try to identify, draw an arrow to each chiral car compound, and then we'll go through that. On this first molecule, you can see that this carbon that has an arrow pointing to it has a hydrogen on it, a bromine on it, that's two different groups, then it has a methyl group on it, and an ethyl group, two more different groups. So that carbon is chiral. All the other carbons have more than one hydrogen on them, so they must be achiral because two hydrogens are the same as each other. If I go to the next molecule on the right, you can see the carbon that the chlorine is attached to has what attached to it? That carbon has a chlorine on it and a hydrogen because there must be a hydrogen there. It also has a carbon with a double bond on it and then a carbon with a single bond on it. So that carbon is chiral. There are no other carbons that are chiral there. If I look at the, the lower left molecule, all of the compounds that have more than one hydrogen, excuse me, all of the carbons that have more than 
one hydrogen are achiral. The carbon in the double bond has a hydrogen and then a, a five carbon substituent and then it's double bound to a carbon. That carbon in the double bond, no carbon in a double bond can ever be chiral because it must be tetrahedral, they're trigonal planar. So it, for it to be tetrahedral, it has to have four single bonds, so you can't select that one. The carbon above it that is in the center of that molecule, it has four single bonds on it. And if you look, a hydrogen and then a carbon with a double bond and then an ethyl group, but on the right you have an ethyl and on the left you have an ethyl, so two groups are the same and it is not chiral. And then this molecule on the left, excuse me, right, bottom right, if I look at each carbon in, that on here, the four that have no methyl group on them have two hydrogens, so they must be achiral. And then the two that have methyl groups on them are both chiral because methyl is one group, a hydrogen is another group. The CH2 that is above the carbon, the top, oh, we're talking about the, the carbon with, on top, the one with the arrow to it. So it's got a methyl, a hydrogen, a CH2, and then it's got the group below that has the arrow pointed to it that is different from the CH2. You see, you have to look at everything attached to it, not just that it's a carbon. The one below is just the same. It would have a, a hydrogen, a methyl, a CH2, and then a CH with a methyl and the rest of the ring attached. So four different groups. This is an important principle because biological molecules like enzymes, sugars, and many, many others like uh, certain lipid steroids and other things, are there all, they all have lots of chiral carbons. And it is the chirality of those carbons that give them a specificity in their reactions. As a result, biological molecules are really restricted in the type of reactions that they undergo because they have to have a certain chirality in order to undergo those reactions. If you look at drugs, most of the drugs that are sold have chiral carbons in them. Right now, most of our drugs are a mixture of enantiomers. We call those mixtures race mates or race mic mixtures. But usually only one enantiomer is the active compound. The other one often will cause side effects that you don't want. An example is albuterol. Albuterol is a, um, it's a bronchial tube relaxer that you inhale and it will cause the smooth muscles in your bronchial tubes to relax. But its enantiomer causes your heart to rate, race. So the company has developed a new drug in which only the enantiomer that causes the smooth muscle of your bronchial tubes to relax is in, the, in there and that its enantiomer is gone. And that enantiomer was the one that caused the heart rate. And this new drug that has is enantiomerically pure is supposed to be easier to take because it doesn't make your heart rate race. Now the last thing that we're going to do in this chapter is learn what a Fisher projection is and be able to slightly understand how to do this. If I look at a molecule, you can see I can draw a chiral carbon with a wing flap where the OH is coming out of the page and then the methyl with the hydroxy group on it, the CH2OH, is behind the page. And this is a way that we can show a tetrahedral and chiral ca a carbon. And you can see that this carbon is chiral. That's what the R says about it. It's, it's a certain enantiomer. You don't have to worry about knowing that. 
but you can see that that carbon is chiral because there's four different groups. A CHO, which is different from a CH2OH, which is different from an OH, which is different from an H. Okay, I can redraw this molecule so it looks like this. And all I've done is I've, I've kind of twisted it around so that this, the, the, um, the two groups, uh, the hydrogen and the hydroxide, are pulled up and spread apart in front of me. And then the CHO and the CH2OH are actually behind the page. This is our basis for writing a Fisher projection. And if I show you this for Fisher projection, the center of the two lines is a carbon. And to that carbon is attached the hydrogen on the left and the hydroxide on the right. So anything that is drawn on the line going across is coming out of the page at you and anything drawn on the line going up and down is behind the page going away from you. Now, I know this is going to be very difficult for you to try and draw these things. Try to do your best on this. I will try to make my, the problems on this not too hard so that you can um, understand how this looks. If you look at the problems in your book, they're going to be problems 1295 through 1298. If you can do those problems, then you can do anything that I would ask for you on an exam, because I know this is rather hard to look at these molecules and convert them into a Fisher diagram. Be sure and do all the problems in the chapter as you read. Uh, and then do the end of chapter problems. There is an online quiz, but it's really important that you do every single problem in the book.